Sutra, what is the essence of comic offenses? Ananda, being one who wants to enter Samadhi, must first firmly uphold the pure precepts. Commentary, the first gradual stage consists of getting rid of the eating causes, which are eating meat and the like. The second gradual stage concerns the essence of comic offenses. What is the essence of comic offenses? Ananda, beings who want to enter Samadhi must first firmly uphold the pure precepts. The essence of comic offenses refers to the workings of the comic consciousness. The comic consciousness must be transformed and that is done by holding the precepts. Firmly uphold means one is firm with oneself. One is not the least bit casual or sloppy. One relies on the precepts in consideration. Anything you did before receiving the precepts does not count as a violation of them because you were in ignorance. If one doesn't know one is committing an offense, then one hasn't committed one. But once you receive the precepts, you can't perpetuate your offenses. Before you heard about the precepts, you may have enjoyed indulging in things which are not in accord with the rules. But once you learn about the precepts, you should receive them and then not indulge in such activities anymore. Sutra, they must sever thoughts of lust, not partake of wine or meat, and eat cooked rather than raw foods. Ananda, if cultivators do not sever lust and killing, it will be impossible for them to transcend the triple realm. Commentary, they must sever thoughts of lust, Lust prefers to love and desire, which are born of ignorance. Love, which is not founded on ignorance in the sense that it is loving regard for one's spouse and children, is not what is meant here. Or if special causes and conditions arise when one wishes to help someone else and one is not just selfishly seeking some ephemeral bliss, that too would be not be would not be considered a violation because one's wish is to help someone else and is one is basically doing something one would prefer not to do in order to help cross someone else over. It is a temporary expedient and is not a violation. They must not partake of wine or meat. One should eat pure vegetarian food. What disadvantages are there in wine and meat? Wine and alcohol, in general, derange one's nature. Once you drink alcohol, you lose your concentration, and then you are likely to do just about anything. You'll be like the man in the story I told before who broke the one precept against intoxicants and subsequently violated all five. If one refrains from drinking, one's nature will not get scattered and one's actions will not be upside down. Another reason is that the order of wine and other alcoholic drinks, which may be considered fragrant by people and ghosts, upsets the bodhisattvas and good spirits. They do not like the smell. Bodhisattvas and arhats regard the smell of wine as we regard the smell of urine. To them, it is rank and stinking. People don't like to be around toilets, says pools and swords, but there are certain box dung beetles who spend their whole lives eating excrement in such pools and swords. They like it. Father, wine and meat are, are rhodesiacs. So people who cultivate the way should not consume these things. They should eat cooked rather than raw foods. All foods should be cooked, even vegetarian vegetables before they are eaten because almost all raw foods will increase one's anger. Ananda, if cultivators do not sever lust and killing, it will be impossible for them to transcend the triple realm. Lust refers to deviant, improper sexual desire. It is absolutely unprincipled to think that a lustful person could become a Buddha. Sutra, you should look upon lustful design as upon a poisonous snake. 
or a wristband foam bandit. First, hold to the south heroes of four or eight Baraji cards in order to control your physical activity. Then, cultivate the Bodhisattva's pure regulations in order to control your mental activity. Commentary You should look upon Lord's full design as upon a poisonous snake or a resentful bandit. Make this contemplation. Lust is like a poisonous snake. If it bites you once, you may lose your life. If one regarded lust as being as poisonous as that, one would not be able to take delight in it. Even thoughts of lustful desire would not arise. Why? Just imagine that such a thought is as violent as a tiger or wolf. It's fine if you don't encounter such animals, but if you do, you're likely to lose your life. Or look upon such thoughts as upon a rebel or a thief who bears a grudge. His resentment pushes him to the point of murder. First, hold to the south heroes four or eight parachikas. You must keep the Shravaka precepts against killing, stealing, lust, and lying. These apply to both the bhikshus and bhikshunis. In addition, the precepts against touching the eight matters, covering and not following apply to bhikshus and bhikshunis. Keep them in order to control your physical activity. You uphold these precepts to keep from creating these kinds of karma. Then cultivate the Bodhisattva's pure regulations in order to control your mental activity. Then you cultivate the Bodhisattva precepts. You receive the 10 major and 48 minor precepts and pay special attention to regulations. Then your mind will not give rise to thoughts of lust. You won't have such devil thoughts. This is a path that people who cultivate must walk. Sutra, then the prohibitive precepts are successfully upheld. One will not create karma that leads to trading places in rebirth and to killing one another in this world. If one does not steal, one will not be indebted and one will not have to pay back past debts in this world. Commentary, when the prohibitive precepts are successfully upheld, Prohibitive implies the practice of restraint. Precepts are defined as stopping evil and counteracting wrongdoing. The precepts are divided into four aspects. Maintenance, restraint, exceptions, violations. Sometimes exceptions are made so that you are not considered to have violated the precept even if you have acted against it. Restraints as already mentioned, refers to prohibitions. They are honored because to violate them would contribute to further violations, as in refraining from taking intoxicants when avoids breaking other precepts as well. Maintenance means upholding the precepts and cultivating in accord with them. Violation refers to breaking a precept. The following event will illustrate the aspect of exceptions. Once when the Buddha Shakyamuni was in the world, there were two bishus cultivating in the mountains. One day, one of the bishus went down the mountain to get food and left the other one sleeping. In India at that time, the bishus simply wore their sashes wrapped around them. They did not wear clothing underneath. This bishu had shed his robe and was sleeping nude. He probably was a lazy person and with no one on the mountain to watch after him, he decided to take a nap. At that time, a woman happened along and seeing the big shoe. She was aroused and took advantage of him. Just as she was running away from the scene, the other big shoe returned from town and saw her in flight. Upon investigation, he found out that the woman had taken advantage of the sleeping Bishu and he decided to pursue her, catch her and take her before the Buddha in protest. He took out after her and the woman became so reckless that she slipped off the road and tumbled down the mountain to her death. 
so one bishop had violated the precept against sexual activity, and the other had broken the precept against killing. Also, the bishop hadn't actually pushed her down the mountain. She wouldn't have fallen if he hadn't been pursuing her. What a mess! Concluded the two bishops. Messy as it was, they had to go before the Buddha and describe their offenses. The Buddha referred them to the venerable Upali. But when venerable Upali heard the details, his verdict was that indeed one had violated the precept against sexual activity and the other against killing offenses which cannot be absolved. You're both going to have to endure the hells in the future, he concluded. Hearing this, the two bishops wept and they went about everywhere trying to find someone who could help them. Eventually, they found the great Upasaka Imalakati, who asked why they were crying. When they had related their tale, he pronounced his judgment that they had not violated the precepts. If you can be repentant, he said, then I can certify that you didn't break the precepts. How can that be? they asked. The nature of offenses is basically empty, relied, replied the Upasaka. You did not violate the precepts intentionally, and so it doesn't count. It is an exception. Hearing this explanation, by the great teacher of Rimalakati, the two bishops were enlightened on the spot and were certified as attaining the fruition. After that, they became a heart. So there are many explanations within the prohibitive precepts, but if people always look to the, the exceptions, they will simply not hold the precepts. They will beg the question. So the Buddha did not speak much about this aspect. If one upholds the precepts, one will not create karma that leads to trading places in rebirth and to killing one another in this world. One is born and then kills, and the victim is reborn and kills the one who killed him. But now karmic offenses created in the cycle of mutual rebirth and mutual killing cease. If one does not steal, one will not be indebted, and one will not have to pay back past deaths in this world. The offenses of stealing will also cease when one stops stealing. I won't take your things and you won't take mine. I won't eat your flesh and you won't eat mine. I won't become indebted to you and you won't become indebted to me. In that way, we won't have to pay each other back. You won't have to pay back the debts for offenses committed in the past once you sever your relationship with animals by not eating meat. If you don't eat their flesh, then you don't have any connections with them. Sutra, if people who are pure in this way cultivate samadhi, they will naturally be able to contemplate the extent of the walls of the ten directions with the physical body given them by their parents. Without need of the heavenly eye, they will see the Buddha's speaking drama and receive in person the sagely instruction. Obtaining spiritual penetrations, they will run through the ten directions, gain clarity regarding past lives, and will not encounter difficulties and dangers. Commentary If people who are pure in this way, who do not eat the five pungent plants, do not drink intoxicants, and do not eat meat, and can firmly uphold the four or the eight parajikas, the precepts, if such people cultivate samadhi, they will naturally be able to contemplate the extent of the wounds of the ten directions with the physical body given them by their parents without need of the heavenly eye. They don't need to have the power of the heavenly eye in order to spontaneously see all around them. They will see the Buddha's speaking drama and receive in person the sagely instruction. They will be able to encounter the Buddhas and hear the drama. They will receive in person the Buddha's compassionate guidance. Obtaining spiritual penetrations, they will run through the ten directions, gain clarity regarding past lives, and will not encounter difficulties and dangers. Their spiritual powers will enable them to go through the ten directions while in this place. 
They will obtain the knowledge of past lives. They accomplish these things with their physical bodies. Although they haven't obtained the power of the heavenly eye, it is as if they had. The same is true for the power of the heavenly ear. They never get into difficult situations or find themselves in dangerous positions. Sutra. This is the second of the gradual stages of cultivation. Commentary. What has been discussed is the need to cut out the essence of karmic offenses. One must rectify one's karma. Until now, it has not been proper, and so one must work in order to change. One must guard and uphold the precepts and rules. Just that the maintaining of precepts is the second of the gradual stages of cultivation.